Welcome to the November College Lecture. My name is Scott Webster and I am the President-Elect of the Engineering Technology Student Council of the Ira A. Fulton College of Engineering and Technology. We wish to welcome and acknowledge the presence of Chad Hawks, Kurt Hensey, and our speaker Steve LeBaron of Boeing, who are on the stand as well as other guests and family members in the audience. We will begin today with a prayer offered by Andrew Broadbent, a junior majoring in chemical engineering. And following the opening prayer, our speaker will be introduced by Dr. David Anthony, who is assistant dean of the college. Our dear Father in heaven, we come before thee in gratitude this day for the many blessings which thou hast given us. We thank thee for the establishment of this wonderful college for this university in which we can learn and prepare to serve our fellow man and have productive career, careers in this world. And we thank thee for the presence today of our guest speaker and for the hard work of the professors and the administrators of this college. We ask thee, Father, that thy spirit might be here with us, that we might learn, that we might be inspired to be better. And we say these things humbly in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. It is my pleasure to introduce Brother Stephen LeBaron. Brother LeBaron is a native of Utah, growing up in Highland, Utah, graduating from American Fork High School. He then graduated from Brigham Young University with a degree in mechanical engineering in 1987. Coincidentally, he was also uh, on the dean's list as an outstanding scholar here at Brigham Young University. Brother LeBaron married Cynthia Smith, and they have two daughters, Mackenzie and Brooklyn. At the current time, Brother uh, LeBaron is serving as a customer engineer for Boeing, and his specific assignment, as he will talk today, was on the uh, Boeing, the new Boeing 787. It's my pleasure to turn the time over to Brother Stephen LeBaron. We like notes. They're good. I am so excited to be here. It is truly an honor to be here at BYU. It's an honor to represent Boeing and the 787 team and share a few things with you. Excuse me if I talk very fast. I've got a lot I'm excited to share with you. Had some amazing experiences that have really um, changed my life and uh, just been a wild ride. I'm happy that my family's here. Um, thanks to my wonderful parents, I had an amazing childhood. Thanks to my wife and to Boeing, I'm still having an amazing childhood. <laughs> Here's what I plan to cover today. To kind of introduce myself a little bit about my role on the 787, better help you understand my perspective and what I've experienced. Talk a little bit about the 87 performance, some of the characteristics and uh, what technologies provided those and some of the things we went through to develop those. Talk a little bit about the global nature of the 787 and how many pieces come various, from various parts of the world. And then I, closing, I have a few personal comments. So first of all, customer engineer is an odd title. I don't design customers. I. Well, I guess the best way to describe it is every airplane, whether it's the bargain basement 737 that goes for $60 million or a shiny new 787 that goes for about $190 million. Every airplane, every airline's airplane is assigned a customer engineer. And the customer engineer's responsibility is to work with the airline to define their interior layout, what options they might have in the flight deck, all the way down to the exterior livery of the airplane, including the engines, the thrust rating, all those characteristics that define that airplane are defined and contracted and then we build the airplane. We don't build them, put them out there on the shelf and have people come with their visa to buy them. Um, that whole responsibility for that engineering is the customer engineers. 
And I and other customer engineers work in concert with sales, contracts, and marketing who are also assigned to work with that airline. Now on the 787, it's a brand new airplane. And so customer engineering was involved in defining what the standard offering would be for the airplane, as well as what the selectable features would be. Like a lot of industries, standardization helps to reduce cost and provide more value to your customers. And so we had a real goal on the 787 to make a group of a family of selectable features that the airline could choose from and define, but really limit the customization because the customization was driving costs for Boeing as well as for the airlines. And you'd customize an airplane for United Airlines, and then when they wanted to move that from United, things were getting rough and somebody else wanted to buy it. It was $5 million just to modify the interior. So standardization and making that better was one of our goals. In addition to that, as the customer engineer, we were lead in communicating the progress of the program, which leads me to the schedule. Now, anyone who's read any news about the 787 knows that we've had a few schedule changes. <laughs> we were originally, um, well, I joined the 787 program in 2003. And at that time, we were trying to gather up customers who would commit to buy the airplane. The goal, like on any new airplane, is to gather up enough commitments from enough solid customers that the board of directors would say, yes, I think we've uh, got enough backing that we can go forward and commit the company, literally committing the entire corporation to building a new airplane. So we were working with a number of airlines at that time. And then in April of 2004, a and &A, which is all Nippon Airways out of Japan, launched the program with an unprecedented order of 50 airplanes. It had been unheard of. Usually you'd get 10 airplanes from this airline, 10 or 15 from another. So we launched the program in April 2004. Now I served my mission to Japan, had handled Japanese airlines for many, many years, and had the opportunity to then be assigned as the ANA customer engineer. And what a wild ride it's been. Uh, we were targeted to deliver the airplane in mid-2008, so that's about four years, about the same time it takes you to complete an engineering degree, maybe five. <laughs> and um, had a few schedule impacts, and uh, it wasn't just a little over a month ago, on September 25th, I sat at the table as we title transferred the very first 787 Dreamliner to ANA. Um, just a li little beyond mid-2008. Um, now, if, as I look at this schedule from my personal timeline, it helps me visualize it even better. When I joined the 787 program in 2003, this is what my two daughters, Mackenzie and Brooklyn, look like. Today, when we delivered the first 787, they're a little bit changed. They were supposed to be in middle school, and now my oldest is applying for college. So it's been a ride. All right. Next, I want to share a little bit about some of the cool features of the 787. The um, 787 range is unusual for an airplane of its size. 767 size airplane normally would fly maybe 4,500, 5,500 miles. And so 787 flies about the same distance that a 777 or 747 does which in the past was something you just couldn't do. You couldn't build an airplane, put enough fuel, and make it work. Well, there are a number of technologies that enable that. In addition to that, the airlines love the airplane because it provides them 20% lower fuel burn. It also reduces their maintenance costs significantly. In addition to trying to do those things, we wanted to bring back the magic of flight. Any of you who've traveled know that it's a pain to travel. By the time you get through security and you almost completely disrobed, and then put your clothes back on. You get to the gate and you're absolutely exhausted, and then the next adventure is to figure out if you can find a place to put your bags, because you have to pay for baggage, and so now everybody crams everything they can into carry-on. So the magic of flight is when it's over today, and we wanted to make the experience of flying something more enjoyable. And there were certain technologies that brought those three items to pass. The first one was composites, and that's been in the news a lot, building an all-composite fuselage, something that had never been done on a commercial airplane, as well as something that's not as well-known as the all-electric or more electric architecture of the airplane. In addition, we've got the most advanced engines on that airplane, and there's a full authority 
fly-by-wire digital um, control on all axes. But I only want to talk about two of these. The first one is the all-electric airplane. Today on an, air, an airplane, a traditional airplane, you take bleed air off of the turbine engine at the back end and you use that hot, high-pressure air to run your um, leading edge ice protection. So you heat the leading edge of the wing under icing conditions. You also use that air to power your air conditioning system. But that comes at a price because you, you bleed that off, so that means the engine have to work harder. On the 787, we eliminated all that. Eliminated it also because of the maintenance associated with the pneumatic system that takes that bleed air off. And what we did is we put on huge, absolutely huge generators, which also function as starters. They're start, starter generators on each of the engines. There's two starter generators on each of the engines, and there's two starter generators on the auxiliary power unit in the tail of the airplane that provides additional power. Those add up to 1.45 megawatts of power. That's about five times what it was on a 767, which is an equivalent size airplane. And to give you a better idea how much power that is, that's enough power to power 400 homes. A lot of power. But all that was done much more efficient, efficiently at extracting power from the engine to power what was necessary on the airplane. The next thing was composites. Composites enabled a lot. Composites enabled making that long, slender, very aerodynamic wing. The wingspan of this airplane is only about nine feet longer than the fuselage. Very long, slender, graceful wings that provide extremely good efficiency. That type of wing would not be possible with aluminum. In addition, because composites don't fatigue and also they're resistant to corrosion, you don't have to worry about inspections associated with maintenance that you do on an airplane. So that is a big contributor to significantly reducing the maintenance costs for the airline. They provide a few of the benefits that we provided our customers as well. One of the cool things about the 87 is the windows. And um, maybe not exciting for an engineer, but these windows are 30% larger by area than the windows that you see on a traditional airplane. And you could never make them that big on an aluminum airplane because wherever you put a hole in the airplane in aluminum, you've got to reinforce it around there to carry that load. And with fatigue, day after day, you just couldn't do that without adding thousands of pounds to the airplane. Another cool thing that we provided the passengers, we did research and found out that passengers were fatigued from travel for a number of reasons. And one of those reasons was the 8,000 foot pressure altitude. When you fly today, you're flying at 38,000, 40,000 feet, but the cabin is pressurized to about 8,000 feet. So it's as if you're on a tall mountain. So if you try and run up and down the cabin of the airplane, you'll get winded rather fast because maybe, maybe not if you live at that altitude. But you'll get winded because the air is thinner. And we found that even people just sitting there, they did chamber studies, that if you could reduce that pressure altitude to 6,000 feet, the number of people that complained of fatigue and being tired and kind of that bleh feeling after your flight, that's a technical term, <laughs> that it would drop significantly. And so we changed the pressure altitude on this airplane to 6,000 feet. And that is only enabled because of the composite airplane. If you try to do that with aluminum, once again, you're adding thousands of pounds. Now, as we went through the development and um, had our different struggles, I guess this, the harder you work at something, when it finally comes to fruition, it's extremely sweet. This is a picture from first flight. If you look closely at my eyes, I tried to make the picture small enough so you couldn't tell that my eyes are just totally red. It was an emotional day for a lot of people, and I wasn't the only one crying. Um, uh, a lot of people put a lot of hard work to make that airplane work. And so I'm going to share with you a video clip that, uh, that has first flight, and I'm going to come back and here and practice Lamont's breathing so I don't cry.
Boeing 001 Heavy Experimental Duties Verified Squawking 4717. 787 Dream Walk. Captain Carriker, uh, Captain Neville, behind the controls, I have 1.35 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, a flight slightly over three hours. The first flight of the Boeing 787 Dreamliner is now complete. There are cool days in your career, and that was one of the top. That was just amazing. Um, we had, at that point, that happened in um, December of 2009, just a bit past when it was supposed to, uh, but it was a big day. Another really cool day was uh, this ultimate load testing, which was uh, you got an all-new composite wing. Prior to this, we had experienced, as we had done some of the testing with this static airplane, the second fuselage to go down through the factory was put under this structure right here. They hook it up all kinds of actuators, and you're going to stress it to a static load. We also have one that does fatigue testing that exercises the airplane up and down thousands and thousands of cycles. This one was to test the 150% ultimate load condition. As you can see on the chart, you bend the wings up about 25 feet. It's amazing. And uh, we had done some testing earlier and discovered we had a problem right where the wings join into the body of the airplane. So prior to what you're going to see, we had gone through a redesign to reinforce that side of body area. And so you got to keep that in mind as you watch this video clip. This wasn't the first time through where everything was going well. This was after a number of things had not gone well. Oops. Sorry. The first flight of the 787 was clearly a major risk reduction event. With that event, we demonstrated that the 787 could fly and fly safely. This ultimate static condition for wing upbending was equally, equally important in retiring uncertainty, retiring risk 
on the program with this test we demonstrated that they all composite wing of the seven eight seven is capable of withstanding a hundred and fifty percent one and a half times the maximum load it's ever expected to experience during its entire lifetime of flying. Uh, test day is a strenuous uh, event for, uh, for the entire test team, uh, particularly those who have designed, analyzed, and built, uh, built the airplane. Uh, during the course of the day, uh, we run through a series of, of events leading up to uh, actually applying loads on, on the airframe itself. The, uh, the test setup is basically comprised of three, uh, three components, the airframe itself, the uh, counterbalance system, which are the orange canisters that you see hanging from, uh, from the test setup, and then the hydraulic actuators that actually apply the, the load to the airplane itself. The blue uh, infrastructure around, around the airplane is uh, basically there to hold the airplane uh, in place and to control all the actuators and react all the loads from, uh, from the actuating system and the counterbalance system. During test day, we, uh, we test the airplane in a series of incremental loading uh, events. Uh, first, we pressurized uh, the aircraft uh, to uh, one and a half times its uh, normal operating pressure. And then uh, from there, apply incrementally a series of, of loads of bending the wing up while simultaneously pulling down on, uh, on the, uh, the fuselage to counteract the uh, upbending of, uh, of the wing. Uh, after we got to 120% of, uh, of our de test loads, we then uh, brought it back down to 80% assess the, the, uh, the data that we, uh, we got for about an hour to assure ourselves that everything was looking good before we proceeded back to 120% and then ultimately to our 150% uh, design objective. Uh, we had about 100 people uh, in the control room during, during test day, including the FAA monitoring uh, the, uh, the test results real time. Uh, the control room is very disciplined and uh, regimented process that we go through. Everyone was focused. Uh, on the task at hand. Once we decide to go uh, to 150 uh, percent, it becomes the quietest 90 seconds on earth in, in the control room. Once we, we pass our, uh, our design of our test objective and start proceeding down, uh, spontaneous applause broke out in the control room. The day we did the wing upbending, I was located with a number of other engineering leaders on the program in a control room in another building. We were watching on a video feed. And yeah, the anticipation in the room was electric. But when the wing got to that 150% load and held it for the required period of time, it was really a great thing to see, to see these people who had designed this airplane had spent so much of their personal time and effort throughout the years to see their efforts validated with this test it was truly a special thing. It requires a huge team effort to successfully conduct a test such as this one. Individuals from a large number of organizations across BCA are involved. Logistics from throughout the enterprise are required in order to conduct a safe test. We actually had to evacuate a portion of the assembly building here. Now that disrupted operations on a number of programs and I can't tell you how much we appreciate the cooperation and teamwork of those programs in order to ensure that we had a safe event. I also want to extend my personal thanks to all those who were involved. It was a day everybody should be proud of. Is that Jim Olganowski that you saw there in that video? Great man. Uh, he's the structures chief that uh, worked through the side of body issue that we have. Some amazing, amazing people there. Hold on. This chart here shows a number of suppliers and partners around the world that are involved in the 787 project. Um, when we set out to build the airplane, we set out to find the best technology so we could build an airplane that would truly capture the market and be able to provide Boeing with profitability in the years to come. If you look at these names, they're all over the world. In addition, you take a look at this chart. Likely you will probably end up working for one of those companies. And if you start looking very closely at the company, you may find out that it's a local company, but it's owned by somebody else. 
the likelihood that you're going to be communicating globally. I mean, it's just, it's just going to happen. Uh, here's the various pieces of the airplane. Some come from Italy, Japan, different parts of the United States. And you've probably seen that really cool airplane that uh, the Dreamlifter, where they took a 747, and no kidding, they, they take the 747 and they take a saw to it, and they chopped it off right behind the flight deck and sawed it all the way down, just barely above the floor and right before the back end, and then they put a big bonnet on it and uh, modified it so that it could carry the pieces for the 787 around the world. Because every time you do shipping, and you've got months and months of millions of dollars in, in progress, that kills your profitability. But um, I've got a cool video I want to show you that talks about, not really talks about, it shows you a little bit about the Dreamlifter, talks a little bit about the uh, PIC, the production um, center that we have that coordinates the global activities so that we know when parts are coming in and such. And it was made in 2010. We were still having a number of troubles. If you listen to the tone, you can feel us trying to reassure the world and probably ourselves that we could do it. I help design We build, we test. The wings? I help build the wings. Cost, weight, performance. Business model. Thousands of man hours. It's beautiful. This is the right airplane. Redesigned and rethought. It was so revolutionary. I knew we could be betting the whole company. We're changing the game as we know it. The 787 is a brand new product, the first jet of the 21st century. Taking on an undertaking like this in development, it's extraordinary. Going with an all-composite wing and fuselage was just a major, major step for the industry. There was some risk. It hadn't been done before. When you're building a Boeing aircraft, there's a legacy that you have to match. You have to build it as good or better. There's a lot of revolutions that went into this airplane that enabled it to fly so much farther than any equivalent size airplane has before. If you look at the factory for the 787, it is very different than a conventional airplane factory. We're working across the globe with very experienced, very sophisticated manufacturers. We created the Production Integration Center to work with our partners all around the world 24 hours a day and keep that global production system working. If I look at the aircraft, what I see is Italy, Japan, Germany. Our engineers work hand in hand on the design and detailed requirements for each one of the systems that we're involved with. We're always trying to find that sweet spot between cost, weight, performance, and a better design. The technology on board this airplane is really nose to tail. This airplane is the first airplane to have a standard dual head-up display. The pilots are going to be very excited in this airplane. Flight deck is the best in the world. We bring technology where it adds value to our airline customers. And whether that's through lower maintenance cost, increased range, a better environment for their passengers. The things that we've learned from developing this platform will influence every airplane that we build from now on. The world named this airplane. I think it helps people identify with it. It's a dreamliner. It's new, it's going to be great for our passengers, great for our customers. It's the way the world wants to fly today. I helped tell the world. We created that. Game-changing technology. And open new markets. The wings, the seats. I helped bring all the pieces of this airplane together. Fuel efficiency. Maintenance benefits. Improved ride for the flying public. 24 hours a day. I helped build this one. That one. Lighter, it's stronger. Less turbulent, larger windows. It's not a dream, it's here, it's now. It is happening today. It's here, it's now, it's real. It's real. It's real. It's real. It's real. It's real. This is the future of aviation. Only a dream until somebody built it. We talked about a revolutionary airplane, and now it's here.
This pause brought to you by Microsoft. Just a second. <laughs> come on. Come on. Ah, come on. All right. So try to imagine just how engineering was truly going around 24 hours a day, whether it was partners who were located around the world and, or whether it was Boeing. Boeing had uh, engineering in Australia. We also have a design center in Russia where we have 1,200 engineers. I often tell my two daughters, you're not competing with the kid sitting next to you in school. You're competing with some kid in India or China or Russia who's willing to study 18 hours a day. So, how'd that make you feel? Not too well, sorry. <laughs> You're already studying 18 hours a day. All right. Now I wanted to share a little bit about some of my experience. I wasn't working directly with partners. I was on the front end working with our customers. When a and launched the airplane in April of 2004, they immediately put together a team that they sent to live with us over the next number of years to provide input, lessons learned from their operation to try to help Boeing help um, create a better airplane for them and for the world. And I was responsible for this, these working together activities, working together with something they had on the 777, which is simply really sitting down and creating activities and engagements with customers where you listen, you ask questions, you understand what's important to them and try to understand what their operations are like, what's important to them in their perspective, in their country and in their operations. As you look at this picture, my smiling face is this guy over here on the, let's see, your left, and uh, much younger looking than today. None of us had a clue what was ahead. We were all smiling. <laughs> if we would have known, we might have ran. Um, but uh, the next number of years, I put together a number of engagements with uh, that local team as well as people in Tokyo, bring in specialists to sit down and listen to them, to understand what's important and uh, problems that they'd had in the past on their airplanes. ANA has unique operations. They uh, fly in Japan where they take a 787-like airplane, a 767, and turn it around in 30 minutes so that they can get a lot of flights out of it every day. So you probably could do that maybe with a 737, but a larger airplane with more passengers to put all the bags on the people on and get them on and off efficiently and turn it in 30 minutes is something unheard of. ANA plans to use this airplane both in domestic Japan, regional China, as well as when they get their long range airplane later in a month or so, they're gonna fly uh, from Japan to Frankfurt, Germany, a route that previously wouldn't have been able to work with a midsize airplane. But anyway, I had lots of opportunities to engage with them. And, um, you know, like any technical project, you've got lots of uh, specifications. You have meeting minutes, you document what you've done, you have lots of email that communicate back and forth. Today is really, it's really amazing. Every day I sit at my computer and I'll either text message somebody, instant message somebody, email somebody, and it, or phone them. And it all depends upon which executive I want to get a hold of knowing which they respond best to. There's so many means of communication out there and in communicating with customers, a lot of times we just always want to shoot him an email and get, get his answer back. And in some cases that kind of communication works well. In other types, times it's more important to sit down or get on the phone. And with Tokyo being so far away as well as our partners, Boeing used what they call these global video conference centers. It was really cool. If you can see the table where you're sitting there, um, that goes there, and up on this big screen up here at the front, on one side, the faces, the smiling faces from the conference room were projected via video from Tokyo, and on the other side it would be the presentation, so you're staying on the same page. You might think to yourself, well, I can do that with a WebEx. Hey, uh, with my computer, I can sit and watch the presentation. I can have an audio telecon. But it's amazing to me how easy it is to misunderstand. Again and again, I would find they misunderstood. That's not what we were saying. But face-to-face, -face, or even this video telecon system, helped you to read their body language. And it also helped to strengthen the relationship. So I'm a firm believer that depending upon the message, you determine the way you communicate. 
And the more difficult the message, the worse the news. Face to face, the one, the only way to go. And I have about 52 trips and over a half a million flight miles to prove it. <laughs> so um, just keep that in mind when you're working on a project. But, uh, a lot of times expediency in communicating truly is not the best way. Now, for a customer engineer, the sweetest day is delivery. I mean, you've worked on this airplane for a number of years, and finally, it's, everything comes together. The airplane gets certified. You title transfer the airplane. You get to see that airplane fly away and head home. And it was especially sweet when we delivered this airplane to a &A. I had the opportunity to be on the other end as well. a and had a huge arri arrival ceremony. They'd waited a long time as well. And here's my smiling face in Tokyo. I was so pumped, so very pumped. Oops. I served my mission to Japan. We'll watch the video. <laughs> Sorry there. We are here today to deliver this airplane to our customer ANA. What do you think about that? Making its grand entrance is the 787 Dreamliner in ANA's special livery. customer than ANA. This delivery signifies we made it. Here's to all of you. Now, when you buy a car, you get a key. When you buy a Dreamliner, you get a really big key. Those were some other really, really cool days.
All right, now you have to suffer through my personal comments. All right. I think uh, I have a number of things that I'd love to share, but uh, one of them is uh, about communication. Like I, I said before, it's amazing how easy it is to misunderstand, especially when you're bridging cultures or um, different languages. And uh, there's a guy in customer engineering, our group, one of the senior managers that talks, uh, that always says, uh, treat others as they want to be treated. And it's a little different than the golden rule, he says, because often what the way you want to be treated isn't the way they want to be treated. And I want to illustrate that with just a very quick clip here. that one it really gets it across treat people as they want to be treated my next point is how you communicate matters as much as what you're communicating and I've said a lot about that so I won't talk any more about that one but uh, the other thing I feel is what you do today truly prepares you for tomorrow um, pictured there next to that uh, bullet item is a ticket it's a ticket from October 1981. When I left on my mission, I flew from Salt Lake City down to LA, from LA to Tokyo. Next day, I got on a, on a um, airplane at Honda Airport, which is one of the Tokyo airports, and flew to Okayama, where I'd served my mission. The really cool thing is that I flew on ANA. The other really cool thing is that it's the exact same route they flew their very first 787 revenue fly on. It's just so cool. Um, what you do today, whether it's studying, whether it's an experience, even if it's painful, you make the most of it and you learn from it and you go on. The next item is um, this little red dude is a, um, is a Daruma. And those of you who've heard of that, maybe you're too, all too young to remember weebles. Weebles wobble, but they don't fall down. It's a little roly-poly, kind of an egg-shaped character that's weighted in the bottom. So no matter how much it tips over, it always writes itself. The expression in Japanese literally translated said, says to fall down seven times, but to get up eight. So no matter how hard, no matter how hard it is and how many times you fall, you you only fail when you don't get up. Eight seven had a lot of times when we fell, but uh, continue to get back up. The last one is a, another Japanese expression, Ichigo Ichie, which means that um, every meeting, every encounter only comes along once in life. Every phone call, every interaction with everybody that you meet only comes along once. And she make the very most out of that. And uh, I have that uh, picture posted above my desk. And it's hard when life's busy. You know, you're talking to your wife while you're watching something on the computer. And I don't parallel process well at all. And so that reminds me every day to make the most of everything, whether it's my kids, my wife, or my work. And that's my thoughts. And I just want to say thank you. 
for this opportunity to share. Thank you. Now, it wouldn't be me if I didn't have a little fun. If you look under your seats, there's four business cards with my autograph on them. And whoever has those and is the lucky winner of a 787 model, you can come up and pick it up at the stand afterwards. Thank you. We wish to thank Steve LeBaron for coming today and presenting this lecture on the 787. Our closing prayer will be offered by Eric Manuel, uh, Jr., majoring in chemical engineering. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for this opportunity that we had to come and listen to Brother LeBaron talk about the experiences that he had working on the 787 project. We also thank Thee for the opportunity to hear him also share his passion for engineering with us. We pray that as we leave here and also as we leave this university to go and contribute in the world of engineering, that we may remember the things that he tried to teach us. And please help us to remember to give all of our work our best effort. Please help us to always remember to be examples of true followers of Jesus Christ. These things we pray in the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.